couple of years. Uh, I think uh, Robert uh, subtitles the talks that he has given on a similar subject from dry friction to black holes. Uh, but uh, <laughs> coming from high energy theory, I really, I really think of black holes as the familiar thing and dry friction as sort of the, <laughs> the, the cutting edge of, of my current understanding of physics. So it really will begin with black holes and move over to, to dry friction towards the end. Okay, so I'm gonna start with a little bit of motivation. As Jan mentioned, I, I got my PhD a while ago at Caltech. So it wasn't so long ago that I actually had any overlap with Feynman who died in 1988, but still, you know, a big name over there. And this quote from a famous, well, best-selling biography of Feynman caught my attention a while back. Uh, and the biography is called Genius of and Science of Richard Feynman by James Glyke. And he points out, like Glyke points out, that Feynman studied friction on highly polished surfaces, hoping and mostly failing to understand how friction works. In fact, I think the story is that um, after, uh, after his first um, his, as an undergraduate at MIT, he spent the summer working for Chrysler. Um, and the project that Chrysler gave him was to study whether you could minimize friction by polishing surfaces uh, very highly. And he realized at the end of this that he had no understanding of, of, of dry friction. Um, and he never accomplished that. And uh, he immediately Gleig goes on to say that Feynman also tried to work on a theory of how wind makes ocean waves grow. It's something that I'll return to in a minute. In fact, um, Feynman didn't advise that many uh, doctoral dissertations at Caltech. Apparently he was not a very good advisor because he just uh, wanted to solve whatever problem he was interested in. He was not good at delegating. But uh, if, you're f if you're familiar, there's a, a very well-known book by Feynman and Hibbs on the path integral in quantum mechanics. So Hibbs actually did his PhD fairly late in life because before that he had worked for, uh, for JPL. And Feynman was his advisor. And that, that, that dissertation, the, uh, the dissertation by Hibbs, is about how wind makes wave, the wind makes waves on the surface of the ocean. But Gleick points out that Feynman later said about this effort to try to understand that, that we put our foot in a swamp and we pulled it up muddy. So this was, again, another failure of Feynman. So uh, coming from high energy theory um, and having failed where Feynman succeeded, I'll now be trying to see if I can succeed where Feynman failed in terms of uh, understanding uh, things like dry friction and how wind makes waves in the water. The, the bit about waves in the water will turn out to be important for reasons that hopefully will become clear soon. Okay, so I'm now going to steal from a talk that Kip Thorne, also a famous Caltech theorist, gave in 2013. I wasn't there, but somehow I found this slide later on. This was, in fact, the talk that Kip Thorne gave um, at the, 60, uh, the celebrations for the 60th birthday of John Preskill. And he's talking about the history of his famous scientific bet. And his first bet, the first uh, scientific bet that, that Thorne made in his career was with Lovich, a well-known uh, Soviet um, uh, theoretical physicist. Uh, in fact, Soldovich was originally a chemist, something that I'll return to also in a minute. And he says that Soldovich knew something that, uh, that uh, Kip Thorne didn't know back then. This is a story that goes back to the early 1970s. And what this was is this question of how the wind makes way makes away from the surface of the water. And I've, I've, I've stolen this from Kip Thorne's slide, altering it very slightly. So the story is as follows. Uh, we know that if the, if the air is at rest, so the wind speed is zero, then the air, because it has some viscosity, will damp, will tend to damp any, any wave on the surface of the water. Uh, so I'll, being a theorist, I'll treat things linearly so that I can use uh, complex, uh, complex variable. So I'll, the perturbation on the water-air interface, which is what we think of as a wave in the water, I'll describe by this exponential, uh, where omega is the phase velocity, uh, k is the wave number, and little v is the, um, the wave speed, the phase velocity of the, of the wave. So omega is equal to k times v. And since the air at rest uh, must damp the, the, the wave on the surface of the water, 
uh, if I want to write down a, a linear wave equation, I should include a damping term, therefore a, a term proportional to the first derivative of, of psi of the wave with respect to time. And here is, uh, here's uh, Sildovich's uh, brilliant and extremely simple argument. Now consider the case in which the air is not at rest. So the air is blowing with some velocity, is moving with some velocity, capital B, with respect to the bulk of the water. Uh, so capital B is the wind speed as seen by the, by the water. Uh, so now I can go to the frame, uh, the frame in which the air is addressed, but this will require doing a transformation. Uh, in fact, in, in Sadovich's original work, which is quoted in the box at the bottom, um, uh, this is done relativistically. He, in fact, he, he, in, in the published papers, he never talks about, about water waves. He, he writes down a, a Klein-Gordon equation for, for a scalar field. But I'm getting this from Kit Thorne that, uh, that Sildovich was thinking about this problem of how the wind makes waves in the water. Uh, and then uh, in order to go to the frame in which, so we go to the frame in which, in which the, the air is at rest, but then the water is moving with respect to the air with velocity capital V. I have to do a, if I wanted to do it relativistically, it would be a Lorentz transformation. Um, in fact, that's what Sildovich does, this Lorentz transformation. But uh, in my experience, uh, air velocities over water are usually fairly non-relativistic. So let me just do the Galilean version. Uh, this is why there's no factor of gamma. So, but the point is that the, the derivative with respect to time gets mixed up with the derivative with respect to position, with respect to x. Uh, this capital V is the, the relative velocity between the two fluids. So now I just take the derivatives of the of the um, of the exponential, and I get that. And then I substitute in the uh, little, omega, uh, little omega is equal to k times v. Uh, so if, if, if I do this, I can rewrite that in this way as minus i k xi times little v minus capital V. So the, the fundamental thing about this is that if the, if the velocity of the air with respect, or the wind with respect to the water exceeds the phase velocity of the wave, the damping term has changed sign. It has gone from being uh, positive to being negative. So now instead of the air damping the wave, it will, um, it will anti-damp it. So kinetic energy will come out of the air and will go into making the wave bigger. And this really, uh, so I, I, looked, I looked into this uh, uh, some time ago. This really is, as far as I can tell, the correct explanation of, of, of how the wind makes waves in the water. So uh, there's a critical velocity, but as, as soon as the air is blowing faster in the phase velocity of a wave, and of course, uh, um, waves on the surface of the water are, are dispersive. They don't have a constant phase velocity. So uh, longer wavelengths have uh, higher phase velocity. So this is why it takes a uh, stronger wind to make bigger waves. Uh, so this is really the correct explanation, even though I, I think this knowledge has not really trickled down to, to, the, to all of the uh, fluid mechanics community, but let me not get into that subject now. Okay, but then this, this, this uh, argument can be made um, quantum rather than classical. Uh, this is a strange thing to do. Uh, last night I was watching a, a talk that my collaborator Alitsky gave last year in, in Warsaw. And he kind of talks, he mentions this at one point, and at the end, somebody asks him what was going on with this quantum oceanography. Um, so let me give you a little bit of quantum oceanography. This is basically, uh, so what I'm going to do is basically taken from a very nice paper on, on superradiance, which I'll go into more in a moment, by the late Jacob Beckenstein and, and Marcelo Schiffer from 1998. Uh, they do this, again, they do this relativistically, and they don't talk about waves on the surface of the water, but I'm just going to translate directly their argument to, to, um, to waste on the surface of the water and do it non-relativistically, just for fun. So uh, there's, so since I'm doing this non-relativistically, the, the total kinetic energy of the wind, I can write down as, as the momentum of this layer of air that's moving squared divided by twice the mass of the layer of air to m. Um, and then uh, any momentum uh, lost by the wind has to be gained by the water just by you know, translational invariance. So that's the relevant symmetry in this problem. So the p dot of the wind has to be minus the p dot of the wave. That's the relevant conservation law. Uh, and then I apply the, um, apply the, 
chain rule to deriving this, this, uh, the first equation. So I get, the, and then I, I substitute the momentum conservation, and I get this relation. And then I introduce quantum mechanics by quantizing the wave on the surface of the water. And I say that P dot wave, so the, the rate at which the momentum of the wave is increasing, I will write down as some, as some uh, flux F. So this is basically how many quanta of waves are being produced by, by unit of time, times the momentum of a single quantum of wave, which as you remember, remember is from when we got quantum mechanics is H bar times the wave vector K. But uh, as the wind, as the wave gains momentum, of course, it also gains energy. So uh, the E dot of the wave, how, how quickly the, the, the wave is gaining energy, should be that same F, the number of quanta being generated by unit of time, times the energy of, of a quantum of, 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 um, of wave, which is H bar little omega. And again, omega little omega is equal to the phase velocity little d times k. So now, if you just do the algebra, you can see that the, con the condition of instability, the condition for the wave to grow rather than decay by the action of the air, was capital V, the wind speed, greater than little v, the phase velocity of the wave. If you do the, you substitute in these relations, you get that this equivalent to um, the h bars cancel. <laughs> so, so this is why the final answer is, should be compatible with a purely classical analysis. And you get that this is equivalent to the condition that while respecting momentum conservation, the wind should be losing energy faster than the wave is gaining it. And now, uh, just think about this for a second. If uh, kinetic energy were conserved, that would make the process forbidden. But of course, kinetic energy is not conserved because this is a dissipative process. Uh, uh, the, um, the wind, you have to take into account the viscosity of the air. So what this tells you is that if you fulfill this condition that capital V is greater than little v, then there's an excess of energy that's coming out of the wind that is not going into the wave. And that's basically, that's heating up the air. So that excess of energy is available to produce entropy in the air. And by what some people would call the fundamental principle of, of non-equilibrium thermodynamics, this is a process that's allowed by the relevant symmetry, which is momentum conservation, and which can produce entropy by heating up the air. So this, this process will occur. So this is, this is, this is um, well, I, I guess I would like to underline with this argument. So this is a fundamentally irreversible process. So more energy is coming out of the air, kinetic energy is coming out of the air than it's going into the wave because the air is heating up. And that's, that's, that's necessary. Um, I'll return to that in a second in the context of, um, of super radiance in quantum fields. Okay, so that's a little bit of quantum oceanography, the H bars canceled. So, but this, 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 as crazy as it sounds, this is, this is really what Seldovich was thinking originally. And in fact, this led Seldovich to the first prediction of black hole radiation. Uh, something I'll say about more in a second. Okay, so uh, let's move on from the quantum oceanography to um, something a little bit more respectable. Uh, so Seldovich in 1971 was the first person to predict that a black hole could radiate. Uh, this was uh, uh, um, a rotating black hole. Um, basically by a version, a version of, of, of applying the same argument, treating the black hole as, as the... As, as a moving quantum, as a, as a moving bath. Uh, so now let's consider a spinning black hole, uh, a Kerr black hole, and capital omega will be the angular velocity with which it's spinning. I'm just considering for simplicity uh, 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 approach of setting. Uh, and now, of course, so so you have here the the, the expression for the electric field it goes as that exponential, where m is the magnetic, uh, people call the magnetic uh, quantum number associated with the asymmetrical direction. But now let's look at things in the co-moving frame, in the frame attached to the spinning black hole. So this is the equivalent of going to the frame of the wind, right, where the wind is at rest and the water is moving the other direction. So now I just do the non-relativistic transformation of the, of the of phi, the angular, the angular coordinate in this uh, along the c-axis, uh, assuming that we have cylindrical symmetry there. So I have to subtract the capital omega uh, times t. And if I substitute that in the expression for the electrical field, it will behave something like that. Now, the super radiance condition, so super radiance has several meanings, but in, for the purpose of this, of this talk, it will be 
this rotational superradiance. What happens, so what, what Seldovich really predicted was that if, if you have a spinning black hole, then incident radiation will be amplified by the, by the black hole. So more radiation will come out than was incident in the black hole at the expense of the kinetic, of the kinetic energy of the motion of the black hole. But the modes that superradiate, so the modes that are anti-damped by the spinning black hole are the ones that fulfill this condition that little m, the magnetic quantum number, times capital omega, the uh, angular velocity of the, of, the, of the spinning black hole, be greater than little omega, which is the, um, which is the, the, the uh, uh, angular frequency of the, of the mode. Uh, and this con so what, what this condition is, is the same as saying that the, the coefficient of minus i t in the exponent, inside of the exponent, should have become negative, right? Because it used to be, when, when if, the, if the black hole isn't moving, the coefficient is just little omega. If it is moving, it is o little omega minus m capital omega. So if that becomes negative, uh, something strange is happening to the, well, classically, it's just that the, the, the co-moving frame is seeing the, the mode moving backwards. But if you begin thinking quantum mechanically, this is, this is, more, this is uh, more unusual because the, um, the, energy of the, of the energy of the quantum of the mode is h bar times that omega. So in the, fra in the co-moving frame, the energy of a quantum of a mode that fulfills this condition is negative. So it, it sees these modes as negative energy modes. So then you should be able to make them while, uh, while um, there's an instability, a right? uh, 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 dynamical instability, because you can make these negative energy modes and compensate with positive energy and, and, and make this radiation. And in fact, this is basically the same thing that has been known in a different context, in the context of the Ginzburg-Frank theory of, of things like Cherenkov radiation, or forms of radiation by uniformly moving charges, and as an anomalous Doppler shift. Because you can think of this transformation, you can think of this transformation of the omega as a Doppler shift. So we've, we're now looking at the at the at the frequency little omega as seen in the commuting frame, and if it has become negative, that's what anomalous means in this context. So if, if the Doppler shifted um, frequency looks negative, then uh, something strange is going on because quantum mechanically it looks like like the the modes of the the quantum of the quantum quantum of the modes of that of that. Um, of, uh, the, quant the, the quanta of those modes have negative energy. So it looks, that looks like a, a, an instability. And this is, in fact, what will happen. But of course, we'll see things in, in, in more, uh, somewhat more sophisticated terms. And I can't resist uh, uh, repeating this anecdote. I, I, I went back some time ago and looked at this. Uh, it's a well known, best selling, in fact, uh, popular book by Kip Thorne from, I think, 19, oh, 1994. Um, and he tells a lot of stories from his own career. And one of the stories that he tells is that he was visiting Seldovich in Moscow, and, and I think it was in 1970 or 1971, when Seldovich had this idea of how a black hole, a spinning black hole, could radiate. And this was the first time that anybody had predicted that a black hole could radiate. Uh, and um, so, uh, so Seldovich called, calls up uh, Kip Thorne at 6.30 in the morning, saying that he has this argument why he thinks that a black hole should, should radiate. So he, you know, Kip Thorne sort of gets up and uh, visit, goes to Seldovich's apartment and hears him out. And he says his reaction was, Seldovich doesn't understand general relativity well enough to compute what a black hole should do. So instead he computes the behavior of a spinning metal sphere. Because you can think of a, a, a dielectric, right, also as something that damps, when it's, when it's addressed, it damps a, a, an incident electrical field. And he then asserts that a black hole will behave analogously, and he wakes me up at 6.30 in the morning to test his assertion. So he was totally unconvinced by this. And in fact, this led to the first bet. They, they made a bet, I think, that um, if, if Seldovich turned out to be right, then he had to give Kip Thorne a, a bottle of um, Georgian cognac. Uh, because this be, no, how does this work? So if, if Seldovich was right, then he, uh, if Seldovich was right, then he wanted Kip Thorne to give him a bottle of uh, Hemingway's favorite whiskey, which I forget what the name of it was that he had read about somewhere. And if, if, if uh, Kip Thorne was right, then Seldovich had to give him a bottle of Georgian cognac, which was very prestigious in the Soviet Union back in the day. 
And the story is that uh, Seldovich won, so this was the first bet that Rikitsan had to pay, pay out. But in fact, the reason why Seldovich conceded uh, that bet is interesting. It's because somebody else who was a friend of Seldovich and who was also visiting him in Moscow in the early 1970s was Stephen Hawking. And Stephen Hawking was also subjected to the same argument. But uh, Hawking decided that he wanted to make a real calculation in, of, of real quantum field theory in, in the curved background of the black hole. And when he did this, he discovered that not just a spinning black hole should radiate, but a static black hole should radiate in a different way, uh, thermally. Uh, this, is, of course, is the beginning of the, of the field of, of black hole thermodynamics, which has become uh, very active over the last few decades. In, in, in Physics. And then as a result of this, in fact, if you read Hawking's original paper from 1974, he, he also mentions this issue of super radiance. And this was the work that really convinced everybody that Sildovich had been right. Uh, there wasn't just some hand wavy argument based on an analogy with a spinning sphere, but if you did, if you did the quantum field theory in a curved background uh, correctly, you would, get, you would get this results. But the, the upshot of this is that a black hole really behaves like a, like a, like a heat bath. So when it's when it's when it's at rest, it can it can damp an incident field. Uh, it also has a temperature, the Hawking temperature, and if it's moving, it can it can do this kind of things that they have called super radiance, and that I'll uh, have more to say. Uh, okay, now let me just warn you. Like I said before, that um, the word super radiance has different meanings. There's something also called super radiance that is totally different. It's uh, people in quantum optics. Uh, uh, know about this uh, due to, to Dickey in the 1950s. Uh, uh, Dickey super radiance is really an equilibrium phase transition. Uh, so this kind of super radiance, what I'm interested in right now, is, is a fundamentally off equilibrium process. It's an irreversible process, which is very important for what I'll say for the rest of this talk. And this is also, like, um, um, since I come from, from, um, from um, high energy theory, I should mention some connections. This is, a, this is currently a topic of interest in, in astroparticle physics. Uh, this idea, going back to Preston Pilkowski in 1972, of a black hole bomb that has been adapted to, uh, to axion searches. Well, I won't say much more here because some of you, a few of you might be interested, but I guess most of you don't. Uh, super radiance, you can super radiate any, any, so anything that can be absorbed by a black hole, which is basically anything. Uh, can also be super radiated if it's spinning. So, for instance, you can also super radiate gravity waves, which is something that also has become of interest recently. There's this very, very nice uh, uh, book-length review by three uh, three relativists, Brito Cardoso and Pani, uh, uh, published in 2015 by Springer. In fact, I, I've noticed that they recently updated this on the archive. Uh, called Super Radiance Energy Extraction, Black Hole Bombs and Implications for Astrophysics and Particle Physics. And they also go a lot into the, into the connections to things like... Um, I'm sorry? Someone so heard somebody? I'm hearing some noise, but... Um, okay, there's also a connection. Uh, this, this has also been applied in the context of what people could call ADS-CMT, which is not what I'll be talking about. Uh, uh, holographic models of superconductors and superfluids. I just mentioned this again because this is a topic of it's a hot topic, say, in in, in 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 theoretical physics at the moment. Okay, so let me see if uh, I, I can't resist showing this video, even though it takes a it takes a little moment, because this is a mechanical analog of 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 uh, black hole super radiance. So here, instead of a spinning black hole, we have a spinning CD. Um, and this, this I, I taken this from uh, from the slow mo guys on YouTube. I think this video. What they've done is they've they've um, they've mounted an old fashioned CD onto the motor of a vacuum cleaner, and then they spin it up. And well, you see, you'll see what happens. Come on, not yet. Soon. So this blows up. <laughs> okay, it now let's, so let's look at this in slow motion. Ben! Come on. Not yet. Okay, so you see what's going on there. Ben! 
it's spinning like at a different speed so it's warp. That's amazing. The warp just seems to be staying there while the CD spins further and further around. Almost like the air is pushing it, it looks like. <laughs> it's it's crazy. ridiculous. It's like it's trying to take off. That's awesome. You can see why it gives out. Yeah. That is some, sh that is some force. I would have thought that the warp would have gone around with the disc. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. All right, here's the moment of impact. Oh. Okay, so what did, we just, what, what did we just see there? Uh, so the the um, if you if you spin the CD fast enough, then uh, these lateral deformations that you saw, instead of being damped by the air, they'll be anti-damped. So they'll grow more and more until you know the, the CD breaks breaks apart. Uh, and in fact, if you if you listen to the audio, uh, they they had drawn a smiley face on the CD, and they noticed that the smiley face is going around faster than the face of the wave. Right? So they, they say that the, the CD is moving through the wave or something like that. That's exactly a super radiant condition. So the, the 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 motion of the of the disc with respect to the air is faster than the phase velocity of the mode. Uh, so then this 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 is a mechanical analog, very close mechanical an analog of of um, of super radiance. So some of the kinetic energy of the of the air with respect to the CD is being used to anti-damp to, to, to increase the amplitude of this of this lateral oscillation until until it gets so large that the that this breaks apart. Okay, but uh, this show this idea of something moving faster in the phase velocity of something and waves being produced, it should remind you of things that you've heard about, like uh, sonic booms and Cherenkov radiation. So again, returning to Feynman, there's this uh, there's this uh, uh, Feynman lectures. He points out that um, very interestingly, once an object is moving faster and the speed of sound will make sound, it's not necessary that they have a certain tone or vibrational character. Uh, Jan at the beginning mentioned that um, that I've written a, a review of self oscillations. Self oscillation is, is an oscillation that's generated and maintained at the expense of something that doesn't have any corresponding periodicity. So in that regard, this is an instance of, of a self-oscillation because you're making sound, but at, what's making it is not something that has a, a, a well-defined frequency, a, a tonal reversion character, as Feynman says. But of course, this, this is also the same thing that happens in Cherenkov radiation. If you're moving faster than the velocity of, of light, the phase velocity of light in a, in a given medium, you make light. Uh, shock waves, uh, many other shocks on the surface of water, for instance, you know, the wake made by a, by, a, by a boat is also something like this. And uh, uh, recently I discovered that somebody who was extremely interested in this kind of things was Vitaly Ginsburg, um, got the Nobel Prize in Physics in the early 2000s for his work on superconductivity and, and, and um, superfluidity. Uh, but in fact, uh, so he was also, well, I mentioned Frank Ginsburg theory. He had worked early on in his career in the theory of Cherenkov radiation. And he, so he, he emphasizes this is something that has counterparts in acoustics and chromodynamics, and strictly speaking, in any field theory. Uh, and later on, I found that, uh, so in 1996, he got the you know, Lomonosov Medal from the Russian Academy of Sciences. And he decided to talk not about his work on superconductivity and superfluidity, but about uh, the theory of, of radiation by uniformly moving charges. And one of the things he says is that um, that's a subject that he loved, and it's a universal phenomenon rather than eccentricity. Um, but I think, oh, and this is, a, this is another quote that I'd like to bring up. Um, so if you look up this old number of a, of a Soviet journal, uh, you'll find an article by Paradoxov. Paradoxov is evidently a pseudonym. It's a pseudonym of Soldovich. So somehow Soldovich didn't want to publish this under his own name, so published it under a pseudonym. Um, and he points out this idea that with quantum mechanics helps us understand classical mechanics because, in fact, the, the quantum argument for the generation of shockwaves, like this quantum oceanography argument that I, that I showed you before, is simpler in many ways than the... Um, than the strictly classical argument, and in fact, it should be also more correct, <laughs> since as far as we know, uh, quantum mechanics is, is, is fundamentally correct, whereas classical mechanics is only an approximation. So let me, let me get back to this, develop this more in a second. So what, what we want to do is, uh, first thing is talk about um, 
super radiance from the point of view of open systems, open quantum systems. Uh, my collaborator in this, Robert Delitzky, is really an expert on, on, on this subject, it's something that I really didn't know too much about until fairly recently. So let me just give you a very, very uh, brief um, uh, crash course on this, for those of you who are not familiar with the subject, as I wasn't until, until fairly recently. So you have a system. Uh, if, if this were a closed system, then the quantum evolution of the system would be unitary. That would be described by by Schrodinger's equation. But now, uh, this, I put the system, I immerse it in a, in a much bigger environment, or just call it a bath. So the bath should be a very large system that can be treated in a, in a thermodynamic limit. So now, because, because the system becomes correlated with the bath, and I lose track of, of those correlations because I'm only looking at the system, uh, the evolution of the of the state of the system is non-unitary, so I can describe it by a by a density matrix uh, row as a function of time. And there's what people call reduced dynamics. So I mean, just um, if I if I'm only interested in the evolution of the system, it would be non-unitary because of the uh, presence of the bath. So I start out with initial state rho at time zero of the system times whatever this, the state of the initial state of the bath is, this little sigma so bath. And then I evolve that according to whatever the full Hamiltonian of the full um, system plus bath uh, 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 Hilbert space is. But then, since I'm only interested in the in the um, in the system, I take the partial trace over the degrees of freedom of the bath in order to get the 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 the, uh, the, um, the density matrix for the for the system alone. And because of that tracing over the states of the bath, then the evolution uh, will look not unitary. Uh, and this people call this the reduced dynamics system for the open system. Uh, this, is, this, this equation is correct, it's written evidently, but it's useless, right? Because uh, uh, this, this, in general, this would be an infinitely complicated thing. In fact, the, the evolution of the open system in general would depend on its entire history. Uh, if, 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 you, if you do this in general. So you, you, you wouldn't just need to know the state of the system, the row at this moment in order to know what it's going to do at the next instant. You would have to know its entire history in order to know what, what it's going to do next. But it turns out that uh, if the coupling between the system and the, and the bath is, is weak enough, then uh, the correlations, the quantum correlations in the bath decay quickly and then you can uh, do a Mark, what we call a Mark, Markovian approximation, a history independent approximation. Mark, Markovian just means that what, what the system does next does not depend on its entire history, but only on its current state. And then you can write down a Markovian equation for the, for the evolution of the system. So I, ha I have the row dot first have the unitary part that you would learn about in undergraduate quantum mechanics. Uh, so just given by the commutator of, of row with the, with the system Hamiltonian. Uh, but then you have a, a non-unitary part. But then that, in this Markovian approximation, you can write that non-unitary part as a super operator, this curly lambda, acting on the, on the row. Uh, so this was done in the 1970s independently by two different groups. There were two papers that came out very nearly the same time, one by Gorini, Kosakowski, and Sudarshan, and the other by Lindblad. So especially in the US, people usually call this the Lindblad equation. Um, Elsewhere, uh, so in fact, uh, my collaborator Alitsky was a student of Kosakowski, so he really doesn't like it when people just say Lindblad equation. So some people say J G K L S equation, um, or just call it the Markovian master equation. And this is a subject that has become interest uh, of interest recently, also in the context of what people call quantum thermodynamics. Uh, here's a reference to uh, to work by, by Alitsky and Kozlov, sort of explaining. Some of, summarizing some of the recent work on how to use this kind of formalism to um, to study work extraction by a quantum system coupled to an external disequilibrium. Okay, so uh, I I don't want to get into the fine details of the calculation, so I'll show this very quickly, but just sort of to give you an idea of what it is that we're doing. And of course, if anybody has questions uh, now or later, I'd be happy to answer them. But the idea is to treat the quantum field as the system. But this quantum field is not a closed system, so it's coupled to uh, one or more baths, and we want to understand so how, uh, how that evolves. From now on, I will be writing uh, factors of H bar for simplicity. Here's the reference to our published work on how to treat the radians from this point of view. So there's a, a Hamiltonian for, for the, the field, the 
we'll, uh, subscript f is for field. So I write down in this way. Uh, again, I'll, I'll be assuming cylindrical symmetry for simplicity. So I need a, a, um, an angular momentum operator for the field in the, uh, uh, along the, the, the axis of symmetry said. So M is the, the magnetic quantum number and I write it in this way. Uh, little omega is, so H by times omega is the energy of a quantum of that mode. Uh, M is the magnetic quantum number associated with this uh, angular momentum or, or around said. And alpha is whatever else, any other, any other quantum number that I might need to think about. So I have, uh, this is a quantum field theory, so I need to have either commutation relations between the A's and A daggers if they're, if I'm talking about bosons or anti-commutation relations if I'm talking about fermions. Um, it's a usual thing. And now I'm going to couple the, the, the field, which is my system, to the bath. And I'll give a linear, a linear coupling uh, for simplicity and also so that I know that the Markovian approximation is valid. So this basically says that a mode is destroyed in the field and made in the bath or vice versa. A mode is created in the bath and destroyed in the, in the field. So the capital Bs are the bath operators. And now I'm going to spin the bath. So now it's not a stationary bath, but a spinning bath. So again, I'm assuming cylindrical symmetry. So I should have this, uh, what you'd expect for the, for the bath operators uh, uh, commuting with the angular momentum operators. Um, and uh, the point is that uh, the approximation, uh, well, the way I'm working here is I'm assumed, I assume that the spinning of the bath is slow enough that it doesn't affect the internal degrees of freedom of the, um, of the bath. So the only thing that the spinning does is to add this additional kinetic energy of spinning to the Hamiltonian of the bath. It doesn't affect the, the, the internal degrees of freedom of the bath. Uh, th there's a minus sign in front of the capital omega times, times L just for convenience. It was better to put the minus sign here than, than to have it later on. But the, of course, this, the, the direction of the spinning is arbitrary. So, so the sign of the capital omega is, is arbitrary. And you can think of this in, uh, in a sense as a, as a kind of a Born-Oppenheimer approximation uh, uh, because I'm assuming that the spinning is low compared to, the, is, is, has low energy compared to the, uh, the splittings of the internal uh, degrees of freedom of the bath so that the spinning doesn't excite anything internal. Uh, this, you can also just think of this as a, as a Doppler shift, like in the, in the Ginsburg frank theory. And now, right, so I'm really not going to go into the details here. Uh, uh, basic, it's not that complicated, but the, 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 the notation just gets kind of cumbersome. Uh, so K will mean, will be a, mu um, a multi-index. And when you see minus K in, the, in an index, it just means the time, time reversal of that operator, so it means the, the, the dagger of that, of the B, of the operator with that same, those same quantum numbers. Okay, but there's, so this is important. So there's a fundamental fluctuation dissipation theorem in, in statistical mechanics that relates the, 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 the correlations of the, in this case of the bath operator to the damping, this little gamma is the damping of the, of the, of the incident field by the bath, right, in this way. And there's a Kubo Martin Schringer KMS condition relating uh, this damping to the to the time reversal of the damping, so we'll, which we'll call pumping. So relating uh, damping to to pumping coefficients. So they're related by a factor of e to the minus beta x. Beta is the inverse temperature. So you 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 see this this uh, superscript zeros on the gammas that just corresponds to the bath at rest. But now I'm going to turn on the rotation in this, in this uh, approximation where the only thing it does is add this kinetic term of, of rotation. Uh, you can think of it as a Doppler shift. So now instead of a zero, I have a capital gamma, sorry, a capital omega uh, upstairs. And this just shifts the argument of this, of this, of this gammas by, by this quantity m times capital omega. And, and the KMS condition, so the cool martin Schringer condition, this KMS condition is something that has to be fulfilled by any, any system uh, in equilibrium with a heat bath at some given temperature. So now we're talking about a system in equilibrium, well, not really in equilibrium, but a system interacting with a bath at inverse temperature beta, but that is moving with some, with some, with some, uh, some angular velocity capital omega. So then this just shifts the, 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 the argument of the exponential and it includes this, this factor m, m capital, capital omega. But this is the really important thing that now if 
m times omega is big enough, that exponential, instead of being less than one, will become greater than one. And then pumping uh, uh, can be greater than damping for a given term. So, so the bath can, instead of damping the, the, the incident degree of freedom, it can pump energy into it, which is the story that I've been going on for a while. So, okay, so you can write down this Markovian master equation for the field. Uh, okay, do that, there's this decay rate. Uh, so from now on, I'll write gamma with a, with, a, with a little arrow pointing down for the decay rate. And then the pumping rate, which I'll write with an arrow pointing up, is related to the decay rate by this, this exponential, which now, because of the motion of the bath, can be positive rather than negative. And then uh, you can write down kinetic equations for the occupation numbers of the modes of the field coupled to these baths. Uh, and you can, you can define the local temperature in this way, using the ratio of pumping to damping. Normally that's always, so in a, in a passive state, that's always, the ratio is always less than one. But the, the thing is that now the low energy modes, the modes that fulfill this super radiant condition can have more pumping than damping. I call them active states. So there are states that you can actually extract work from because you can write down an, uh, an equation, a differential equation for the, this is the kinetic equation for the occupation numbers of the, the modes. And it's the, if you, when you see plus minus, it's plus for bosons and minus for fermions. Uh, you can also think of this as a Markovian process, a birth-death process in this way. Uh, and so uh, the big difference between uh, fermions and bosons is that fermions have a plus sign here in what's, what's in, the, in the little square in, in light blue. And that's really stimulated emission. So the more, uh, the more modes you pump into that state, the more that increases the pumping. So that, so that, that just has, it gets you an exponential runaway, which is really what, what gives you the super radiance from the quantum point of view. Uh, Pauli exclusion principle, on the other hand, gives you a negative sign. So the moment that, that you pump the fermion into the state, it's populated, and then you cannot, you cannot occupy it by, by any further states. So it really stops, right? So there's no, there's no stimulated emission of, 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 of uh, fermions. So then, then there's no, there's no stimulated, there's no super radiance of fermions, which is something that people have known about for a long time. But uh, this is the, what we consider a more fundamental explanation of what's going on. And in fact, if you don't like this Markovian master equation approximation, uh, Michael Aberelitsky a long time ago, one of the things that he showed was that that calculation for the pumping and damping rates of a, of a field coupled to a bath, weakly coupled to a bath, basically just reproduced the, the, the Fermi Golden Rule that we all learned about in, 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 in undergraduate quantum mechanics. Um, so you can also just, from now on, think of computing that and using the Fermi Golden Rule. Okay, so I need to speed up a little bit so that I can get to the fermions. Uh, but from this point of view, uh, super radiance is basically a form of laser action. Because what you, what you have is you have population inversion of the low energy modes. So the population inversion is just this, right? That you have a greater pumping than damping for those modes. Or if you want to, they have effectively a negative local temperature for those modes. And then you have stimulated emission, and then you get, you get, uh, you get uh, lasing, or in this case, super radiance. That, that's really what it is. So the, the, the radiation from a spinning black hole is kind of like laser radiation. In fact, the important thing is that it's, 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 um, it's not thermal radiation, or like Hawking temperature. So another way that I could say this is, uh, we, we know for, we've known for a while, lasing is, is, a, is a, a thermodynamically irreversible process. So the, the lacing really has to heat up the lacing medium. So not all of the energy that you take out of so the plug in the wall goes into making the laser. Some of it just heats up, heats up the medium. So if you unplug the, if you unplug the laser, then, um, then that, um, the, 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 the medium, the lacing medium still has some temperature so it can still thermally radiate. radiation of the, of, the, of, the, of the black hole at rest, and the super radiance is like the laser action. Uh, uh, but, so th th I would say this is like a more fundamental quantum understanding of the super radiance, but this analysis, which we did a couple of years ago, it mostly reproduces what people already knew about, about, um, about, um, about super radiance. Uh, but also super radiance has a perf can be understood classically, uh, well enough, but in the, last, in the last few minutes that I have, let me just say, this led, this led us to something that I think is fundamentally new, 
Uh, so, uh, which is what happens if uh, what happens with fermions? Okay, so fermions don't super radiate. We know that, uh, but you still have population inversion of the modes uh, that fulfill this condition. So now I have to since they're fermions, I need to include a, uh, a chemical potential. So now the condition for population inversion of the fermionic modes coupled to a moving bath is that little m times capital omega plus the chemical potential mu be greater than little omega. So um, there's, there, this cannot lace, right, because fermions don't have a stimulated emission by the exclusion principle. But now I'm going to put in a second bath because the problem is that in this population, in, in the most of the fermions that are population inverted, you can pump, uh, you can pump a, a, a fermion into, into an excited state, but then uh, you cannot draw any more because there's no, there's no stimulated emission. But what happens, so that then they would stop, there would be no super radiance, but then what happens if you have a second bath and, and this pump mode decays into the second bath, it cannot decay into the original bath, but if it decays into a second bath, then that again becomes available for, uh, that, that, that mode becomes available to pump another fermion into it. And if you keep doing this, then you can sustain a current, an active current between the two baths from this, from this process. Uh, but this is something that, as, as far as I can tell, it really, you, well, this is not very surprising because as we're dealing with fermions. This, you cannot understand this classically, right? This really requires a quantum treatment. And this is what I, what I want to finish with because I think it really might be the, the explanation of something that we've known about for a very long time since the ancient Greeks, which is tribal electricity that, that, that you can separate electrical charges by rubbing things together. Um, but this, uh, I, I would say that there hasn't been a, a fully satisfactory micro, microscopic explanation of this yet. So uh, this is um, a bandy graph generator, which some of you might have seen in practice. Uh, so uh, this is from Purcell's uh, well-known book on electricity and magnetism, and he says, you know, in, in anything that generates a, 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 an EMF, uh, you really need to uh, transport, something has to transport the, the, the charges against their electrostatic uh, interaction. Uh, in the case of a Van de Graaff generator, part of that is just being done by a motor that's physically transporting the charges that are on the rubber belt against the electrostatic difference between the, between the, the, the bulb upstairs, which is here really positively charged and a negatively charged um, casing downstairs. But uh, uh, Purcell says we need not consider the means of putting charge on and off the belt, which is really this triboelectric effect. So the rubbing between the metal brush and the and the and the rubber, the rubber uh, belt is somehow doing part of that job, right? It's transporting charges uh, against the so it's 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 building up electrostatic potential at those points. Also, notice something that uh, confused me for a long time, like, uh, which is that I, I, um, in the in this in this diagram of the of the Van de Graaff generator at the bottom. The electrons are getting off from the belt and onto the the brush, so this is why the, the 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 belt becomes positively charged. But then at the top you have an identical brush, and there the electrons are getting back onto the back onto the um, the belt from the from the from the from the bulb um, the dome outside. So you have two identical brushes, but in one place charge is moving in one direction, and the other one is moving in the other direction. The only difference is the voltage. Um, um, because the, the, the casing downstairs is grounded and, the, and the, the voltage upstairs has a very large potential. But the Van de Graaff generator is a little bit too complicated, so let's at least something theoretically simpler. So I have two different materials, A and B. I'm assuming cylindrical symmetry for the same reasons as before, just to make things uh, easier to derive analytically. At the end, I won't need the cylindrical symmetry. And material A is spinning with some, with some uh, angular velocity capital omega and rubbing, therefore, against the other material, the hollow outer cylinder, uh, material capital B. And this is, if, if you choose the materials correctly, this should gen generate a small electrical potential difference, which you can use then to drive a current in an external load. So here, current is, is being driven around in a circuit as long as you keep the, uh, some motor keeps turning the, the, the inner cylinder A. Even though uh, classically, by the Maxwell Faraday law, you don't really have any EMF, any electromotive force, because uh, classical electromotive force would require a time varying um, magnetic flux through the, through the circuit. And here, the, 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 the magnetic flux is, is, is uh, 
negligible in any case, right? It's clearly not growing linearly with time, which is what you need in order to get a, a, a constant EMF. Okay, so now I had some, I have some memes and some jokes, but I see I'm badly running out of time, so um, <laughs> I, I, I should skip some of this. But um, the EMF uh, is a concept that goes back to Volta in 1801. And it's really, so the, uh, some modern people who looked at this in 1980 translated what Volta was saying and what, what, what Volta called an electromotive force was some non-electrostatic action on charges in conductors that causes unlike charges to separate and to remain separated. So this is really an active non-conservative force. It's a force that does positive work. Um, and you might have heard people say that a battery is kind of like a, a pump, right? So it's... It's, it's, it's something that, uh, pop, uh, that builds up a potential, just like a hydrodynamical pump can build up potential by pumping water up, right? But it's not the potential difference itself. So none of this can be understood purely in terms of, it, it's a, a, a pumping or an EMF, it can build up a potential, it can charge up a potential, but it's not the action of a potential. Uh, so um, the idea here, so again, since I don't have a lot of time, this is in the, in the paper, but let me just, give you the general idea. So now we need two baths, right, for the reason that I said before, because these are fermions, so these don't super radiate. So uh, the baths will be two bulk materials, which I'm calling capital A and capital B. And uh, I, the, those materials have surfaces, and the surface attached to capital A I'm calling little a, and the surface attached to capital B I'm calling little b. And one of them is moving with respect to the other. Now I can write down just a linear sliding velocity, which is the radius. Uh, the radius of, uh, of the cylinder times the velocity at which it was spinning. So now I, I write down Hamiltonians for the, for the electrons in second quantization. Uh, so the zeros here mean at rest. So I'm not, I'm not yet considering them moving. So you see a little x upstairs in the first one. The little is because it can be little a or little b, depending on which of the two surfaces I'm talking about. And then down on the second equation, there's a capital X upstairs because it can be either capital A or capital B, depending on which of the bulk materials I'm talking about. So now I'm going to, I'm going to move material A and its, its attached surface. So the Hamiltonians are going to shift from the ones with zeros to ones with omegas. And then this is just this Doppler shift that, that I've mentioned several times, which will be giving us the, the interesting, interesting results. Uh, so there's some, there's some probability for direct transition between bulk and surface. So we can just call this bulk surface tunneling. I'm not trying to compute that in any kind of detailed model. I, I wouldn't know how because I'm not a condensed matter physicist. But I'm just uh, assuming that there's some, there's some uh, non-zero uh, possibility of amplitude for, for, for going, from between the, going from the bulk to the surface. So this is why this, this coefficient little g has a capital X upstairs and it will X downstairs. So it, it's from either from capital A to little a or from capital uh, B to little b. But there, there might also be a possibility of, of a transition between the bulk and the surface. I'm not going to worry about uh, interaction between the two surfaces. Uh, partly this is just for simplicity. We won't need it in order to get uh, triboelectric charging. Uh, so, and since this is a qualitatively new model, you might want to write down the simplest thing that gives you charging. But another justification would be that we'd expect that the, that the surface states would be localized in the transport direction, in the direction here perpendicular to the surface, which is what I, what I want in order to get a triboelectric effect. So you'd expect that this, if you consider that interaction between little a and little b, it would only give you a hybridization that you could absorb into modified wave functions. It wouldn't, it wouldn't contribute to the transport uh, from capital A to capital B. So the, the total Hamilton that I'm considering is this one with the moving uh, surface A, the surface B at rest, the moving uh, bulk material A, the bulk material B at rest, then there's a, an interaction between uh, bulk A and surface A, an interaction between bulk B and surface A, an interaction between bulk A and surface B, and an interaction between bulk B and surface B. Uh, and you can write down a kinetic equation for the for the occupation numbers of the of the electronic states on the surf for the surface modes. It will look this way. The uh, uh, the capital uh, up arrows are uh, pumping rates, and the down arrows are decay rates. And here is just the, 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 the important thing is just this, right? That in the in the pumping rate from 
a surface little a to uh, to to um, to bulk big B, you get this right that the, the exponential is shifted by this uh, m times capital omega. So now again, the point is that this if this exponential if the argument of the exponential becomes becomes uh, uh, negative instead of positive, right? So you get e to the minus b times minus beta times something negative, then you can get more pumping than decay. So then this is actually an active state uh, rather than a passive state, and you can extract work from this and use this to, to uh, generate an active current. Okay, so you can do the, you can do the calculations. Uh, in fact, you get two currents, which we call J sub little a and J sub little b, flowing in opposite directions from, from, from one material to the other. The net current is the sum of those two. Um, and okay, so let me skip the details. You can read, the, you can read them in the paper that's in the archive. Uh, you can show that uh, as as drawn, those two currents are always positive. So little j always points from capital A to capital B, and j sub b always points from capital B to capital A. Um, so the sign the sign of the net current is going to depend on um, on what? Let me just go to the next slide. The sign of the total current, which is the sum of those two little currents depends on the relative magnitudes of those two of those two things that are written there. Uh, so they're not the same because one material might hold on more to its surface electrons than another material. And it's that difference that, that should really be giving you a net direction for the charge of the flow. And in fact, Jan just a couple of hours ago pointed out to me there's a very recent paper in, um, in Nature Communications about this triboelectric series. So when you rub two things together, which one becomes positively charged and which one becomes negatively charged, saying that this, this is strongly correlated with the work functions of those materials. So how much energy it takes to remove an electron from, from the surface of one material, which is what, what I'd expect, right? So if one material holds on more to its surface electrons than the other, then that would clearly give you a, 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 an, an asymmetry there that would tend to give uh, uh, an electron, uh, a triboelectric current flowing in that direction. But it's always about comparing the two materials that are, that are in contact. Uh, this can also explain why the current flows in opposite directions in the two terminals of the Van de Graaff generator. Basically because as it charges, it moves the chemical potentials by how much it has charged. So when you change this, you can change the, you can change the relation between those two little currents. As a high energy theorist, so one thing that excites me, right? So this is, this is already a, a, a CP violation, a charge parity violation, right? Because you, when you rub two things together and current, net current flows one way rather than the other. And I think, you know, originally you rubbed cat fur against amber and amber became, I forget which one it was, negatively charged, I think negatively charged, and then the cat fur became positively charged. So <laughs> in some sense that violates, uh, CP gives you a direction for current flow. Uh, but this is totally different from anything that has been considered before in fundamental physics in this kind of context because it's a thermodynamically irreversible process. And since it's an irreversible process, it's also time, time, time parity violating. So it's also p-violating. So I think that's interesting. I would like to look at it more. Also notice that the surface is rough. So the surface is something very complicated with a structure, usually at the order of micrometers. Uh, so the relative, the relative magnitudes of these two coefficients that control the direction of the current may vary over that scale of roughness. So you can have current flowing in one direction, one part of the rough material, and the other direction, the other part of the rough material, which is in fact what is seen in, in, in practice when people have looked at uh, this kind of... So the, in net, you get a net effect where you get more charge in one material than in the other, which is this triboelectric series. But if you look microscopically, you find patches of positive charge and patches of negative charge of order, of size of order micrometers on the two materials. Okay, so in the last uh, three minutes, let me just say, so this is, the, this is not a detailed model at all, but it's a qualitatively new model and it's promising for reasons that I'll try to summarize very quickly. So uh, the electrons on the surface, right, they will, you can write their, their, their quantum numbers as a uh, uh, wave number in the azimuthal direction in case of M and in the, in the set direction in case of C. The, Fermi wave vector has a maximum value, which should be of order of interatomic size scale. And if you look at the equations, I didn't really go, I had to show them too quickly. So, uh, but if you, if you look at the equations before, you can see that the best you can do in terms of, in terms of um, uh, triboelectric charging 
is that the, the, the greatest possible voltage, or if you want chemical potential difference that you can build up by this process, is bounded by, and now I've re reintroduced h bar just so that I can then plug in some numbers, h bar times k sub f times this lighting, linear sliding velocity v sub s. You will usually do much worse than this because one of the currents will counteract the other current. But if, if, if one of the current is almost negligible compared to the other, you, will, you, you would approach this, this, this bound. So it's a bound that depends on this lighting velocity. This is very important. Uh, and of course, it depends on the, on the wave, uh, the Fermi wave vector for the surface states. So you'd expect uh, Fermi wave vector to be of order interatomic separation, order Armstrong scale. And if you write a, a, a linear sliding velocity with, between the two materials of order one meter per second, you get a maximum possible charging of 10 to the minus five volts, which seems very small. So it, it's certainly not what you get in a, in a Van de Graaff generator. But in the Van de Graaff generator, once you've done the separation of charges, then the motor is physically pulling them apart, right? So something that's a, a, just mechanically pulling the positive charge away from the negative charge, and then you're increasing the voltage by however much you've increased the separation between the two, the two, uh, the two uh, charge layers. Uh, uh, so, in fact, in a, in a Van de Graaff generator, originally the separation is interatomic scale or Armstrong scale, and finally it gets to be meter scale, right? Because a Van de Graaff generator is something that the separation between the, the dome at the top and the case at the bottom of, of order several meters. And so this, this, this would multiply by 10 orders of magnitude going from interatomic to, 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 um, to meter scale. And that's, in fact, what you see in a Van de Graaff generator that gives you a voltage of that order of magnitude, of, of orders of, 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 of um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of volts, which is what they used to be used for, for particle accelerators. OK, so let me just finish because uh, I've, I've spent too much time. I, if I had, had enough time, I would have talked about, um, about dry friction specifically, but yeah, clearly I should, I should finish now. So what's, what's the option of what I've told you before? So there's this phenomenon of super, ra super radiance, which has been known for a while. And I would summarize it. Uh, so going back to Ginsburg saying that this has an, uh, an, an, an analogs in any field theory. So if something can damp an incident degree of freedom when it's at rest, so it's a bath, if you make it move, if it moves fast enough, then it, might, it, it should also be capable of anti-damping that degree of freedom by turning some of its kinetic energy into the energy of the incident field. But of course, this is always an irreversible process, necessarily an irreversible process. So it needs to generate entropy. And that entropy is generated in the heating of, of, the, of, the, of the material. So in, in, in black hole super radiance, in fact, super radiance or the Penrose process always increases the surface area of the black hole. Um, this is what, what it means in black hole thermodynamics for it to be an irreversible process. Uh, there are many things that can be interpreted in this way. I didn't have too much time to go into this today, but uh, I, we really think that uh, the generation of shock waves might be better understood, even if, even if the, 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 the shock wave ends up in a classical regime, right? The, the process of the generation of shock waves can be understood uh, quantum mechanically in this, in this manner. And then the, the, the thing that's qualitatively new is that people have known for a while that fermions don't super radiate, uh, but uh, there's, you can still cause the motion of the bath to make some states active, to make them have more pumping than damping. And then it turns out that if you introduce a second bath, what we found in this recent work is that you can use that to sustain a current. Uh, so basically to create this EMF, this, this mysterious force that causes charges to separate against their electrostatic uh, attraction and to stay separated in order so that you can, it becomes electrical work that's then, then uh, available to do something else. So then this might be a description of the microphysics of electricity. It's a process that, um, that is velocity dependent because this is a fundamental thing, right? This, 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 is, this is a fundamentally irreversible, thermodynamically irreversible process. It can explain, for instance, the fact that uh, people have pointed out this for a while, that many of these, for instance, uh, I guess I skipped that, but it had, a, it had a slide of some scotch tape in it, but the, uh, the Soviet physicists who looked at this kind of addition for a while ago, they point out that how much work it takes to peel tape increases very, very quickly with how quickly you, you, you pull out the tape, right? So you pull out the tape very quickly, it takes a lot of work. If you pull it very slowly, it takes much less work. So this is really velocity dependent. This is something that can only be understood uh, off equilibrium or, or, or irreversibly. Any kind of description based on potentials 
wouldn't give you this kind of um, this kind of a, a, a feature. Okay, so I've I've gone over time. Uh, hopefully, some of you can stay for questions. I can stay, right? Uh, uh, but I'd, I'd be happy to to stay for however long John is willing to keep hosting this. <laughs> thank you, Alejandro. I will ask the audience to uh, thank you and clap, but I think that would be a mess. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, yes, we indeed have time for uh, for uh, questions and discussions for whoever wants to stay. Um, so the talk is now open for that for whoever has a question or or comment. Well, yeah, I guess I'll get started <laughs> um, since no one is asking. So. Could you go over this uh, business of the second bath? I'm having trouble picturing. Yes, yes, Is yes. the second bath enclosing the system? Is it enclosing the first bath as well? Okay. Where is it? <laughs> so here you go. This, it's, it's fairly simple. So here in, in, in this diagram, you're still seeing my screen, right? Yeah. Okay, very good. So the system are the surface electrons. Okay. Uh, both of them. So the system are the electrons on surface little a and on surface little b. Mm -hmm. And now I'm coupling them to two different baths, right? I'm, cou I'm coupling them to um, the bulk of material capital A and the bulk of material capital B. So you can have transitions between surfaces and either of those baths. Uh, ah, and right. for and right, I'm, I'm just I, I, I could if I want to give them different temperatures, but that's really not useful or relevant. So I'm giving them the same material temperature, but they can have they can certainly have different chemical potentials, for instance, mm -hmm. and that can be that that in fact that's important because if you be, if if you begin getting so let me let me move on a little bit further to no wait a second um, here yeah here uh, so now I, I'm drawing this current so I I, I get. So, the, so what, what we get in this, in, this, in this calculation is that you can get a, a current, electrons, electrons flowing from capital A to little a. Of course, you know, uh, this will happen for a little while, but then you should reach some steady state in which you're not constantly accumulating electrons in the surface, right? That would, yes. that would, that would not be a, a good steady state. So, so then you just assume that when in this steady state, you have the same current of electrons, uh, J sub a, and they cannot, they cannot go back to A, right? <laughs> so the only place that they can go is into B. So then, so then uh, you have a, you actually continue that, 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 um, that uh, arrow at the top from little a to capital B. And the point is just that, that if, if you didn't have that, nothing interesting would happen because the, the surface states would just saturate and then that's it, right? So uh, uh, you don't, since you don't, have, you don't have stimulated emission of fermions, Right. But if, if, if you have the second bath B in there, it can, so you, you, the, the motion pumps, uh, the, motion pumps the, the, the electron from the bulk to the surface, and then another bath uh, takes it away, right? So the, 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 the pumped electron then decays into the other bath, and then that's available for another electron to be pumped from A, from capital A to little a. Mm. And then you can just keep doing this, right? Uh, uh, yeah. and th this this can this can maintain uh, uh, an active an active current and in fact so it can be active right because it, so it, it's it can give you what Volta would have called an EMF because you're you're, you're transporting electrons um, not necessarily from high uh, from high chemical potential to low chemical potential you can be building up chemical potential in this way but the, the same thing happens uh, uh, the other direction which is the, the arrows uh, below right you have um, you can have uh, uh, transitioning tunneling if you want from bulk capital B to uh, surface little b, right? And then if the uh, if another bath A is available to take that electron away, then you can sustain a current in that direction. In fact, in general, you get both currents, and both currents will be positive as drawn. They're necessarily positive as, as drawn. So of course, if you have exactly equal materials, you'd expect that no matter how much you rub them. Um, the two currents would cancel out. But one thing that I, well, now I have time to mention this, so I'll mention it now. Even if they cancel out exactly, these are irreversible processes. So this, these processes are heating up, necessarily heating up the bath. They're heating up A and B. They're, they're generating entropy in the bath. So yeah. even, even if you have rubbing without charging, 
uh, this is this is certainly a dissipative process. This should still be consuming consuming energy. So this might have something to do with dry friction just by itself. Mm. Even though dry friction probably also involves other things like super radiating of very 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 uh, soft surface phonons. Okay. Uh, but but that that's already consuming. But, but of course, then the point is that if if one material tends to hold on more to its surface electrons than the other, then you'd expect that uh, J sub A would not be exactly equal to J sub B. So then you can get a net, a net charging. And also, like, like I said, the, the surface is rough. So it's, it's, it has a lot of structure at the micrometer scale. So you can certainly expect that this coefficients would vary at that micrometer scale. So then you, you this might explain what people have seen in recent years, which is that uh, you get patches of positive charge and patches of negative charge uh, just in general for, 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 for rough, rough surfaces uh, 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 sliding together. Uh, but for given materials in average, when you've averaged over that, uh, over that uh, micrometer uh, mosaic of, of, of charging, you get more charge going in one direction than in the other. Hmm. Okay, just another quick question. So, if, sure. do you, for the dry friction case, do you have a prediction of how it should radiate? I mean, that that someone can go and test it. Uh, how it should radiate? So, okay, so I, 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 there there are some there are some uh, slides that I skipped. So, so let me just say a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Let me because okay, so so this this process alone. Uh, should consume some energy, so it, it, it should have some. Okay, maybe, maybe this this is something that I should uh, I like to show, because again I started with Feynman, so uh, Feynman tried like I like I said at the beginning he tried to understand uh, uh, dry friction and failed. Incidentally, dry friction is very different from viscous viscous friction. Uh, viscous friction, where the force is proportional to the velocity, is well understood, right? We we, we teach this in in stat mech, right? There's the fluctuation dissipation theorem, so we we know what happens to the to the energy that is lost to to um, to viscous uh, to viscous friction, but dry friction, uh, which is uh, where the force is approximately velocity independent, is a different story. And Feynman says in his lectures, formerly it was thought that um, uh, surfaces were full of irregularities and friction originated in lifting a slide over the bumps, but this cannot be, for there is no loss of energy in that process, whereas power is in fact consumed. What he's saying here is that. Uh, no matter what, whatever it is you're doing to the materials when they're, when they're rubbing against each other, you're deforming them for a while. But the, so deformation one way can consume energy, but then it, since right, it's not deforming forever, it should come back to its original configuration. And if, it, if, if it's a potential, just whatever you gain, uh, whatever energy is consumed by deforming it one way, will come back when, when you let it, when you let it uh, regain its original shape. So, so no potential can describe the power consumption that is in fact seen in dry friction, right? Where you're constantly losing uh, mechanical energy to heating of the, of, the, of the materials that are rubbing against each other. And then he says, uh, the mechanism of power loss is that the slider snaps over the bumps, the bumps deform and then generate waves and atomic motions that after a while heat in the two bodies. So what he's saying is that in some way, uh, this rubbing um, generates uh, phonons. So uh, I would say uh, super radiates phonons, right? Uh, and those phonons then thermalize almost immediately. Um, and this, this, so we're, this is something that we've thought about a little bit. This is this, uh, people know about this very soft surface waves in, in porous materials and in, in rough materials. There's a theory of this. And uh, this, and uh, um, they, are, they have nonlinear dispersion relations. So the velocity grows quadratically initially with um, with um, with wave number. Uh, so this means that the phase velocity is going to zero at long wavelengths. Yeah. Uh, uh, very slow, uh, but with so, so the, the the critical velocity for super radiance is going to zero as 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 the k is going to zero. They, they also have a, a cutoff at you know, the, the micrometer scale, at the scale of the, the porosity of the, of the surface. So uh, that probably is that's almost certainly going on in, in, in dry friction, that you're super radiating is very, very, weak, uh, very soft uh, surface waves. Um, 
also people also call them Rayleigh waves. Some of this has been measured, so there's some information about um, about the behavior of some of these of some of these surface waves. In fact, one thing that I didn't talk about: some of those some of those phonons that you make in the rubbing, they could assist tunneling. Uh, 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 so they they could enhance those those factors of G that I was writing before. But this is something that we're not yet in a position to compute. But uh, the other point is that even without this, so even without the super radiance of phonons, which probably my guess at the moment is that it's probably the main mechanism of power consumption in dry friction. Even without that, um, just as triboelectric currents uh, are already consuming power. And uh, I, that's something that we haven't quite gone around to computing, how much power is, in, if you rub two identical materials, right, and this J sub A and J sub B are equal, mm -hmm. uh, have some understanding of how much power is that already consuming, how much heat is that, is that, is that generating? But that's uh, that's something that uh, that we're looking into. But okay. I'm not in a position to say something concrete about that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, questions? Anyone else? Uh, I have a quick question. Sure. Yes. Andrew? Yes. So now that you answered this about the uh, the deformations that you could have while you're rubbing two materials. Yes. So. In order to um, to dissipate this heat, there must be a permanent deformation in the materials, right? Yes, yes, yes. Which is which is what which is why uh, Feynman says in the Feynman lectures that this is not a plausible explanation of, of dry friction. Okay. Because because if if you if if in fact that would be uh, there, there was a uh, PRL recently some months ago. Uh, yes. About whether the flexoelectric effect can explain uh, tribal electricity, yeah, and I would make that same argument against uh, against that explanation because the flexoelectric effect is is a potential effect, so it's conservative in that sense, right? So if you if you deform the material, it charges. Then if you let it go, it discharges. So the only the only way in which you could be generating an EMF, which is a non-conservative force, right, from that is if you were constantly deforming it. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, because uh, otherwise, whatever you gain in, in 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 deforming one way, you would lose when you let it go back. So, and this, of course, our, our model evades that, right? Because it's really, it's really, uh, it's 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 radiating, right? So that that's where the energy is going. Another way to think to think about uh, think of, uh, sonic booms, for instance. So, you if you have a plane moving, to, if you have a plane moving through the air. Uh, it's losing some energy to viscous friction, right, which we understand. It's probably losing energy in other ways. But the moment it passes the sound barrier, right, it, it experiences a much, much stronger drag, uh, just because, right, it's, it's evidently it's losing some of its of its of, of its uh, kinetic energy to uh, making the so the sonic boom. So yeah. then, so then that's not that's not mysterious, right? How you would be without constant deformation, how you would be constantly losing uh, power in, in in this kind of uh, phenomenon. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Fabian. Um, any other questions for Alejandro? Okay, I guess not. Um, so, just uh, to conclude, uh, let me. Well, Thank you again, Alejandro, for uh, sure. being our sure. first speaker in uh, this uh, online series of uh, colloquium talks. Um, it was a, a great talk. Uh, we also had a great attendance. We had a, at, at its peak, it had 34 participants, and uh, we <laughs> lost uh, four. <laughs> right. Well, I, I did go over time, which is something that I have a yeah. lot of trouble with. So. Yeah, <laughs> I can't, okay. can't blame them if they had, they had some, somewhere to be at four. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as I said at the very beginning, um, more or less the idea is to have a uh, talk every other Wednesday. Um, unfortunately, next, so on, on, what is it, May the 13th, uh, we have a faculty meeting. Uh, so we cannot, we're not going to have a clocking talk, but we're going to have the next one on May the 20th and then the, right the week after. So we're going to have two clock in talks, uh, uh, two weeks. Um, and I've also attached the program for the uh, uh, next talks 
on the Zoom chat, so you can check it out. And I will also be sending reminders, as I usually do. Uh, so with that, uh, let me thank Alejandro again, and thank I will be much, ending Ryan. the session. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye, thank you. Okay, goodbye. Thank you.